Quem é você, né? All right. Welcome to the Father's house. Good to be here today. We have a party atmosphere, of course. Uh, Danny will be wearing a lampshade at approximately 12 o'clock today. He will. And uh, anyway, I heard something interesting this week. Uh, there's an elderly pastor, and uh, he was getting ready to pass away. And uh, just before he went to be with the Lord, he invited two members of his congregation to come and be at bedside with him. And uh, one of them was a uh, lawyer, and one of them was an IRS agent. And uh, so they're sitting there by the bedside, and he's getting ready to go into glory, and, he, and uh, he's holding hands with these two guys. And the lawyer asks him, he says, you know, Pastor, we're just really honored that you asked us to be here as you're getting ready to go to be with Jesus. And he said, why, why did you choose us? And the pastor said, well, uh, because Jesus died between two thieves, and I thought if it was good enough for him... <laughs> Good enough for me. And, uh, anyway. All right. So, we're talking today about putting on the God kind of love. It's kind of an unusual... Yeah, hallelujah, it's right. It's going to be a good one. Putting on... I mean, why did I use the term putting on love? I mean, isn't love an emotion? Isn't it something you feel? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, first, I want to tell you about uh, two words uh, in the Greek that are translated in the New Testament as love. One is agape. Anybody ever heard that word, agape? Yeah, as in sloppy agape, right? <laughs> agape can get sloppy among church members if they think it's a love based on emotion. But agape is the God kind of love. Simply put, it's a sacrificial, completely selfless kind of love. You know, people give something, even with the best of motives, a lot of times they're looking for something in return. I give a gift to somebody, I hope they give a gift back to me, or at the very least I hope they smile at me or like me a little bit better because of this gift. Uh, parents try and buy the affection of their children sometimes. Uh, couples try and buy each other's affection with gifts. Even people that give, let's say somebody donates a million dollars to a hospital wing. Well, a lot of times they put a plaque on there. So it's not like the person who's giving doesn't get something in return. Or if nothing else, we give and we get a good feeling. And you say, well, Pastor Mike, it's natural to get a good feeling when you give. Yes, it is, but the point I'm making is that human beings, we tend to want something in return when we give. The God kind of love wants nothing in return. He just gives because he loves, period. And that's a very special, it is the highest type of love, the word agape, when it's used in the New Testament. Now, the second one that's used commonly is called phileo in the Greek. And phileo is good. There's nothing wrong with phileo. I mean, it may pale in comparison to agape, but phileo is a more human type of love. You can say it's a fondness. It's uh, when you care about somebody in the human sense. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. I, I love you. You love me. I love you, a bushel and a peck, a bushel and a peck, and a hug around the neck. You know, it's that, that kind of a humanistic feeling to it. But let's read the scripture together, shall we? And I'm going to have Matthew read out loud, and you can read out loud with him if you don't mind. Go ahead, Matthew. It's John 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, the son of Jonah, do you love agape me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love phileo you. All right, stop right there. Saying, Notice two different words. Two different words. Peter said, well, Jesus said, I, do you, Agape. Yeah, do you, do you love me with the highest type of love? Peter's response was, I'm fond of you. I care a lot about you. He's responding with a different than what Jesus is asking him. Go ahead. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love phileo you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love phileo me? Simon Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love phileo you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. All right, so what, what changed in the third time Jesus asked Peter? 
he switched loves. He said, do you, are you fond of me? Do you care about me? This is a really interesting exchange for a lot of reasons. One, let me just make this point for all of you budding pastors or people that are interested in pastoral ministry. Many people read this in the, in the King James or in some of the other translations, and they think Jesus is asking the same question three times. And they think Jesus is making the same statement following the question. People kind of, they look at this and it's like, three times Jesus said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Well, that's not at all what happened. Jesus asked these questions, then he made three different statements. The first time, Jesus said, feed my lambs, not my sheep. In other words, he's giving pastoral instruction to Peter, who's going to be one of the heads of the church after Jesus is crucified, in a sense. So, feed my lambs. Well, okay, the babies. You know, we have kids in the nursery. We have children in class right now. Jesus really cares. And also, when a person first receives Christ, they're kind of a, a newborn Christian. It's important to Jesus that as shepherds, and really all of God's people have a heart to take care of the newborns. The little children, you don't want to neglect them. You want to make sure they have nice, clean uh, areas to be taught. The teachers are skilled and they love the kids, you know, but also new Christians. We want to make sure that we care for them. The second statement that Jesus makes to Peter is, train my sheep. Train my sheep. It's translated... Uh, Tend, but it's, uh, the word training has to do with discipline. It's really a word of mentoring and discipleship. Once a person is born again, they need to be taught the Word of God. They need to be discipled personally by somebody, if at all possible. See, they need to be exercised. You know, sheep, let's just go back to the analogy of sheep. If sheep just sit around and eat all day, they're just going to get fat and die. They need to be, you know, walked around, you know what I'm saying? The, the shepherd... A good shepherd knows that he needs to not only feed the sheep, but exercise them and train them. A good pastor does the same thing. You provide, and we provide uh, you know, new believers class is coming up soon, discipleship, leadership class, ministry class. We provide all these opportunities. If you know me personally, I'm always getting with guys over meals or just hanging out. and just Because uh, that's the best way discipleship happens, is just hanging out. This is good. But this cannot replace one-on-one -on -one discipleship. It's what our men's group is all about. Uh, the Band of Brothers is a discipling and training men. That's what our women's ministry is about. It, we want to have people getting with people older with younger to teach and train them. And then the third thing Jesus says is feed my adult sheep. He says, once you are born again, you're saved, and then you are discipled, you still need to eat, right? Right? I mean, how long ago were you born? Mike Witherby, what year were you born? 1957, yeah. Did you stop eating when you got to be able to take care of yourself? Obviously, no. Me either, no. No. And so, so even when you're trained and skilled, you still need to keep eating. You still need repeated nourishment. That's why the, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You know, I want to say hi to all of our people that are watching us on live streaming. But I want to tell you, if you're in the area and you're physically able, we would love to see you come and, and actually be with us because you can get a, a, a good sermon. Actually, it's a great sermon if it's me, and you all know that. But, but you cannot replace the love, the support, the hugs, the acceptance, the friendships that you build by being in a good church. And so we ask you, if you're anywhere in the area, please, and you're able, please come and be with us. We have, even have rides available so let us know if you need that we welcome you here all right now that's the pastoral training that was here but it's interesting the exchange of words notice that uh in verse um 17 it says peter was grieved because jesus said to him the third time do you phileo me do you love me now people i've heard preachers say well peter was grieved because jesus had to ask him three times no Peter was grieved because the third time Jesus used a different term. Because Peter could not honestly respond. His love for Jesus had not grown enough to where he could say, I agape you. His response was always, I am fond of you. I really care about you a lot. So the third time Jesus changed words, acknowledging where Peter was at. And it hurt, it hurt Peter's heart because he wished he loved Jesus more. Anybody here this morning would like to love Jesus more than you do today? Yeah. It's your choice entirely. 
you know, there are people who love God. There are people who just have a mocking spirit, just a rebellious spirit. And you have to lay that down, really. It, your eternity is at stake. You have to lay down that prideful, rebellious thing that just, you know, God says tomato, you say tomato. That's, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere except separated from God and separated from people who might love you. Okay? So I'm just begging you, lay that, please lay that attitude down and just say, Lord, I love you, but I don't love you as much as I want to. Help me to grow in my heart towards you. I'm going to tell you, that's a prayer God hears and he answers every time. Amen? He really does. Uh, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Matthew, would you read this? It's up on screen. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. All right, so uh, when Christians are babies, what do they need? They need milk. And Christians need the milk of the... Mm -hmm. Need the word of God. Now read Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. All right, so it's okay. It's good to drink milk when you're a baby, correct? You can suck on the bottle. Oh, look, isn't that cute? Look, he fell asleep with the bottle. But if you're 47 years old and you're still doing that, that's not very cute, is it, Bernie? How would you like it if a 48-year-old man walked in here wearing nothing but a pair of diapers and rolled around on the floor and said, goo goo ga ga, and he had a pacifier? You know, he'd say, I just want to tell him, get out of your parents' basement, okay? Get a job. You know, be, you know I mean, what the heck? And, I, you know, this society today, sorry, I got on a little tangent there. But Paul is expressing some spiritual frustration in Hebrews 5 because now he's dealing with some people who don't want to grow up. They're like Peter Pan, you know. I don't want to, I'm not going to grow up. I refuse to grow up. I'm going to stay a little boy forever and have fun. And I, you know, grown men playing on their video games and doing stupid stuff instead of getting a job. You know, you see this. I see this a lot. I see men freeloading off of women. It's just sad. I mean, if you're out there and listening to me, let me tell you, ladies, if you have a man who will not work, then you've got a problem on your hands there. You know, if you're not married, you need to move on. If you are married, you just need to, I don't know what to tell you to do there, but, uh, but I see so much of that. I see just so many men who just don't want to become adults. They want to stay little boys forever. How many of you ladies want a real man in your life if you're not married? Yeah, I'll say that again. I want a real what? A real man. Okay. And I don't have to explain what a real man looks like. <laughs> what? Did I miss something? What did I miss? Oh, big amen, all right. <laughs> okay. Amen is right. But, so, there was frustration here. And pastors get frustrated sometimes. I even do. I know you don't believe that, but I even do. All right. Colossians chapter 3, from The Voice, verses 12 through 14. Since you are all set apart by God, made holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with the holy way of life, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put up with one another, forgive, pardon any offenses against one another, as the Lord has pardoned you, because you should act in kind. All right, stop one second there. Now he's talking about a spiritual adulthood. If you're an adult, these are some of the, the traits that you'll have. Compassion, kindness, humility. Amen. I'm humble and proud of it. No, that's terrible. <laughs> that's for you, Mark Powers. That's for you, buddy. That's Mark said that the other day. Um... And I told Mark, he's got the cold, so he didn't want to come. And he's watching. Mark, hug your... I told you I wanted to give you a hug. I want you to hug your computer screen right now. And I'll, <laughs> I'll feel it in the spirit. Here you go, buddy. All right. And so he's, this is the, a description, a brief one, of spiritual adulthood. Christians who are grown-up believers. Now read the last thing. But above all these, put on love. Love is the perfect tie to bind these together. That is such a strange... When I first read this as a young believer, I just thought, what an odd way to say this. Put on love? You know, because in our language, in our vernacular, like the colloquialism is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting you on. 
you know, I, I'm putting that sounds like a to me it sounds like a phony thing, but in you know this time period, this is a whole different thing. Paul doesn't just say love one another here, and let me tell you something about the Bible. First of all, when the Bible uses different words or different phrases, it means different things. So instead of saying love one another, he says put on love, like putting on a garment, a sweater, you know. Today I put on my very cool looking Cavaliers uh, hoodie because the Cavaliers were around in the 80s and I don't have any 80s stuff to wear. So this is my thing. But he says put on love like a garment and that's because the word love here is again the word agape. That's the word that Paul is using. He's telling us that we can wear God's love like a garment, like an item of clothing. I discovered this reality in the 1990s, actually in the year 1990. I had gone away for prayer and fasting at the first of the year. I was gone for three days and just praying, and while I was away, I was in a cabin in the woods, and the Lord just gave me a tremendous revelation of the Father's love. I knew God the Father loved me, but I was used to, you know, I always thought in terms of Jesus Christ and his grace and his sacrifice and his work on the cross and you know, and I would pray to talk to Jesus, etc., which is fine. It's wonderful. But I, at that time period, I really didn't know that you could also have conversations with the Holy Spirit and with the Father, and I didn't f- realize fully the fatherly love that was coming towards me that I was missing from heaven. God wants to pour out his love. He wants to hold you. He wants to minister. His, he wants you so close to him that you can actually hear his heart beat. When you lay your head on someone's chest, sometimes you can hear their heart beat. I would hold my uh, boys when they were little. You know, Michael was my firstborn. And he's a police officer now. He's 34 years old. He could actually maybe beat me up. And, uh, but I remember holding Michael on my chest and rocking, and his little ear would be against my chest. And, I, and you know, babies just love that. They can actually hear your heartbeat. And I would speak to him in low tones like this, and I would, because your chest rumbles a little bit when you do that. It has a calming effect on the baby. And I would sing to him, Swing low, <laughs> sweet chariot. Yeah, I sang bass and baritone in choir in school. And so, anyway... I, that's how close the Father wants you. He wants to pour his love out in you. And he doesn't want you to just keep it. He wants you to give it away. And the more you give it away, guess what? He gives you even more of his love. It's like he, he always replenishes and then some. So I came away anyway from this three days of prayer and fasting with this revelation. And the first Sunday I spoke on the Father's love in a way that I never had spoken before. And all heaven broke loose. It's, it, three months of full-scale revival just happened spontaneously. And uh, where is Susie? Are you, yeah, you remember, don't you, Susie? Yes, you did. Yeah, changed her life completely. Now she's all about the Father's love. She runs our food ministry. All Susie ever does is hug people and love them. She doesn't care, man. She just doesn't care what you look like, what you... You know, nothing. She just grabs anybody and hugs them to pieces. And the father's love pours out of her because she's a true daughter of her father. She is daddy's little girl, so to speak, with God the Father. And just comes out of her naturally. And so I returned, and you remember, Sue, how the church was, and all of a sudden, that Sunday it started, the father's love was poured out, and the floor was scattered with people. Some of them were weeping and laughing, and, you know, it was just an... It was just an incredible revival. So I mean, with the Spirit it lasted three months. There were 40 recorded uh, healings during that three-month period. You were there too, Sean. You remember that? It was incredible. I mean, actual doctor-verified healings that were happening. It was an amazing three months. And the presence of God was so intense. The atmosphere in that church was so charged. I remember I, I anointed around the uh, altar area with oil. And there was oil spots in the carpet. Nobody cared because um, the altar was incredibly charged. 
And uh, I remember, like, my youth pastor was teaching, and then he, in the, in the middle of that service, he came in, and he walked over the threshold. There was, like, a side door in that church where you come right into the altar area. He walked in, and, and he fell down. He was so overcome, and he didn't know what was going on. He thought it was business as usual service. No, it wasn't business as usual service. He was on the floor. Then people were waiting in line, Pastor Lee, until the service went. We started at 10. It went until 4 o'clock. Nobody left. The, the, the atmosphere was, it was heaven on earth. And the line went back to the door. And were you ever in that church? It used to be Lamb of God, and then it was Emmanuel. And in there, Lee. So you know, it was a long aisle. And the uh, people were in, the, in line all the way to the back. We didn't have a guest speaker. It was just me and a, an elder. That was it. Actually, a couple elders, and one on each side. And we're just praying for people, and God's touching them in powerful ways. And people told us later... We, just, we didn't feel anything while we were coming up. And as soon as we stepped onto the carpet in the altar area, we felt this surge of God's love, surge of God's power. Now, the atmosphere was so intense during that time, I began to realize, and this went three months like this, I began to realize that my human phileo love was really insufficient. When you get in an atmosphere that holy... Uh, I mean, myself and the leaders, we would come in. We would go, so, so careful, Danny, not to say anything that would grieve the Holy Spirit. So careful, you know. We didn't want to do anything that would harm what God was doing during that time. And so I began to pray this prayer before every service. God, help me see people the way you see them, not the way that I see them. And help me to love people with your love rather than my own love. My love is human. It's fallible. It's, it's not enough. What I didn't realize I was doing was I was doing Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. I was putting on God's love. Like a, a, you know, a sweater over my own. It's not that I got rid of the, the human phileo love because people still need that. But on top of that, I was clothing myself whenever I was around anybody, not just for services, clothing myself with his love and not my own. So I began putting God's love on, and it worked. And I still pray that prayer to this day. And people tell me this all the time, and some of you have said this. Pastor Mike, you have so much love. I just They, they tell me, we just feel the love of God pouring out of you. And every single time people say that to me, I think to myself, what? Me? How is that possible? I know how I am. I live with me. I know what a stinker me can be. You know, Joy? I mean, I look in the mirror and I go, you little stinker. You know, honestly. Because I know that without putting God's agape love on, I get impatient with people. I get frustrated with them, just like you do. I, I get angry. I think thoughts like, what's the matter with this guy? Why can't he just straighten up and fly right? You ever hear that term? Am I dating myself with that? That's like from World War II or something, or from, I don't know, the Stone Ages. I don't know, but... Why can't this guy just do what I tell him to do? Why can't you just do the word? I've told them 500 times the same thing. Why can't this lady just get herself together? Because how many times do I have to counsel you the same? And I think these thoughts, I'm not the sweet little angel that you think that I am. I know, come on, just look, act like you think that, okay? Just pretend. <laughs> but when I pray that little prayer... God, help me see people the way you do. All of a sudden, my demeanor changes. It's amazing. And I'm, it's like I'm looking, well, it's like I'm looking through <laughs> the blood of Jesus or the love of God, you know? Like, I'm looking through a different lens when I see people. And then I don't see the little stinker that you are. I know. I know you pretty well. You are a stinker, Matt. 
That's that's good. If I could just shower your demeanor, I'd be happier. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, because you got a great sense of humor. Look at uh, the next scripture, uh, Luke 24:49. Read it out loud with Matt. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, clothed with power from on high. Amen. We can be clothed with His power. Clothed with the Holy Spirit. And clothing serves three basic functions. Number one, it makes you look nice. Or it makes you look goofy if you have lousy taste. But either way, clothing, you know, clothing is good. Number two, it keeps you from walking around naked. Which would really make a fool out of yourself if you did that. And you'd be arrested. And the leaders would take you out of our church pretty quickly. Number three, it insulates you and it protects you from the elements. See, I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit, the clothing, when you're endued with power from on high, and endowment simply means clothing, if you're endued with the Holy Spirit, uh, it protects you from yourself. It protects you from being an idiot, from being angry at people, from shooting uh, off, from, you know, just shooting from the hip from saying, blurting out things that hurt people's feelings, hurt their, uh, hurt their future sometimes. You know, Holy Ghost clothing has saved my patoot, patootie many a time. Okay, many a time. Look at Luke chapter 6 now, and this is really, this is going to challenge all of us. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, yes. and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Yeah. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Yes. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. <sighs> All right, let's just quit and go home now. No, no party, no, I just want to go home and cry, because I'm going to tell you something, I can't do that. I, myself, I can't do that. I cannot love my enemies. I'm too Italian. There's vengeance in my blood. I want to tell you, I cannot love my enemies. I can't do that it's, it's too much for me it's beyond my ability this kind of love loving your enemies think about the person in your whole life that did the worst things ever to you the worst betrayed you I've had a few real terrible betrayals I can't do that in myself this what Jesus is talking about here this is an operation of the Holy Ghost and him alone. He's the only one that can do this. Jesus understands people. He knows how awful we can be to each other. How rude. How nasty. And how mean that we can be to one another. Yet, he loves people anyway. He loves them anyway. He loves your, your enemy. The person that hurt you. He even loves them. And he sets the bar really high in the scripture, don't you think? When I read this last night, I was thinking of like a, uh, a chin-up bar at school. And when you're little, you know, you can't reach it. So you jump. How many of you remember that from grade school? You jump, you try and get up there and grab that thing and then, uh, do your, your chin-ups. There's a little guy jumping up and down. That's how we are with this kind of thing that the Lord asks of us. It's so high that only he can reach it, meaning that we can't get there unless he comes behind and lifts us. You see. And Jesus will do that. Even regarding how you feel about your worst enemy. He can come behind and lift you higher than being that mean, bitter, vengeful. 
you know, rehearsing it over and over again, what this person did to you, and how much you just hate them and just want to, ugh, they deserve blah, blah, blah. They should taste the fires of hell. I know none of you ever thought that, but for me, oh yeah, I go to sleep and involuntarily the hurt and pain of a past betrayal will come back to me. I'm trying to sleep and, you know, it's, it just comes involuntarily. It's not like you want to think of it. And then I'm laying there going to sleep and I'm going, you know, I could, maybe I could dream of just about choking this person, and <laughs> watching the life ebb from their body and then I'll wake up and repent in the morning. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anybody ever get that thought? And, uh, I'm ornery. I'm sorry, I'm ornery, okay? Jesus knows that we can't do that. But he presents himself. He says, put on my love. Put it on. Grab that sweater out of your closet. Don't let it just sit in there and be moth-eaten. Grab it out of there. Put on the agape love of God, the Father. Now, a word of wisdom here about this. Loving and forgiving your enemies is not a command to trust them again. Amen? Aren't you glad about that? Some people think it is. You pray for them. You reconcile if they are willing to. But you don't open your heart to be destroyed again by anyone. Because for, forgiveness is something that's given freely, but trust has to be earned. We had an inner healing conference once at our church years ago. We had John and Paula Sanford there, authored many books. They're like, you know, the foremost, they're the go-to people in regards to the healing of the soul, the healing of wounds, etc. And uh, John was preaching in our pulpit during that conference, and he was talking about this very thing. And some guy raised his hand, and I just so appreciate it, because this guy was so honest. He said, are you saying that, like, if we have to love and forgive them and then put our heart up on a table and let them do the Mexican hat dance on it all over again? I just, I'm like, thank you, buddy, for asking that, because I wouldn't have the guts to say it that way. But he's like, oh, yeah, just put it out there and let this guy dance all over my heart again. And I'm like, and of course, you know, John answered with this basic answer what I'm giving you. Look at Jesus, how Jesus regarded guarding his own heart. Look at John 2, 23 and 24. Go ahead. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He would not what? Entrust. He would not, he didn't trust people to care for his heart, to care about him enough. Listen, the same people that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, as he rode in on the, the foal, one week later were shouting what? Crucify. Crucify. Yeah. He was a little too, you know, a little too vociferous there when you said that, guys. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, leave me alone, you know. <laughs> he knew what was in the hearts of man, that there is a Judas lurking in every one of our hearts. You're loving me now. Well, will you love me a year from now? Will you love me if I accidentally offend you? You see, and that's, that's the, the dilemma we're all in. If I don't do what you expect me to do, will you still love me? You see. And as a, as a senior pastor for 32 years, I can say that love does not always happen. Sometimes all it takes is one thing. You say one wrong thing. And all of a sudden you go from being good pastor to evil pastor. And there's no in-between. It's an, an incredible, when you're a leader, it's even more pronounced. And so I understand certainly why Jesus had to guard his heart and could not entrust himself to people fully. Now, the only one Jesus fully entrusted himself to was who? His Father in heaven. Absolutely. And so should you. Only fully entrust your heart to your Father. Because he's the only one who will, without question, every single time, care about it, care about you. I had a young lady just this morning uh, message me. She lives in Canton. And uh, you would know her, Susie, if I mentioned her name, because she's been to the food ministry. And uh, she would love to come here, but she's just too far to pick up. And I don't know if you're watching. I, uh, hi, sweetie, if you are watching. you know. But she said, please pray for me, Pastor Mike. My husband... Uh, choked me and, and hit me and he's in prison 
for assault because of that, and I'm so lonely, I'm so desperate, please pray for me. And I said, sweetie, I will pray for you. I said, I wish you lived up here, because we'd love to pick you up and bring you to church. And if we did, we would hug the hurt and pain right out of you. We would love the hurt right out of you. You see, it's not easy to find people that will love you uniquely and genuinely and selflessly for a lifetime. Very difficult. I'm very blessed to have a wife that has been with me since 1980 we've been married. And she loves me fully and I love her fully. We have a committed love, an action-oriented love, which is what marriage should be. My heart breaks for those of you that have been through divorce because it must be very painful when two become one. I've had so many people that have gone through the tragedy of divorce and they've told me many of it's like a death. It's like part of you is just, you know, just pull out. And it's just so hard to replace that because in God's eyes, you, you did become one when you got married. And many of you, it wasn't your, it wasn't your wish. Someone left you. Someone chose to reject you. And that's very, very, very hurtful. Well, this, uh, let's read one more scripture and then I'm going to close. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 and 8. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. I love that scripture, don't you? Amen. If this kind of love seems impossible to you, it's because it is. But Jesus can do it through you. My mentor, Leon, who was with the Lord, Leon Price, always said to me over and over, said, Mike, don't forget, love never fails. Other things are going to fail. Real love never fails. And if, if it doesn't accomplish what you're hoping when you first act it out, just wait. The person that you've shown love to will never forget the act of love, whatever it is. Pammy just picking people up. They'll never forget you for that. You will be etched in their minds until the day they go to be with the Lord because of your acts of kindness. And I told this to several people. I had several people contact me this morning. I told them about you. you know. And I said, listen, she is the kindest. One person said, I don't know if I can call a stranger for a ride. I'll say, I said, Pammy won't be a stranger for more than five seconds. <laughs> I told this person, you are the sweetest kindest person that I've ever met that walks the face of the earth today. I've never seen Pammy judge or hurt anybody. She's always just a loving person. The perfect person to pick people up for church. How do you grow in love? Three things. One, you feed your spirit on the word of God. Yeah, I was thinking about teaching on body, soul, and spirit. I might do that soon. Because you've got this organ inside of you that's not part of your how you think or how you emote or the choices you make. It's the deeper than that. It's your spirit. And when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and he, he joins. He, he marries you with your spirit. Like It's incredible. And you walk together with God from that point on. He's there and he leads you and guides you. And it's a beautiful relationship. Feed your spirit, though, with the word of God. Because, you know, if you want to build, make a muscle there, Christian. What do you got? Let me see. He's got some guns there. Do you work out? Yeah, there you go, man. Look at that, dude. Yeah. Are you single? How old? <laughs> How old are you? Nineteen. Ladies, there he is. The man of the hour. But see, you didn't get those guns by, uh, you know, just sitting around, right? You worked out. And now you can, like if somebody asks you which way the beach is, you go, the beach is that way. <laughs> Or maybe it's this way. I don't know, but it's, you know, and you're like showing off. Oh, yeah, you know, right? Well, it got that way by exercising, and your spirit gets strong by exercising it. And that book you're holding is the best way to exercise your spirit, make it grow. Number two, build a deep relationship with the Father, Father God. We talked about that earlier. A love relationship. Don't, do not view God any longer as this big, mean judge, somewhere up there in the sky, he wants to hit you with a billy club every time you screw up. That's not who God is. He is a good father. He wants nothing for you but your success. He wants to give you a peace and a joy that passes 
human understanding. And then number three, you have to exercise this love. You, got, you can't just put on love and then sit around and play with it. You put on love so that you can do acts of love towards other people. Love is an action. Love is not a feeling. You hear that, young people? Megan, love is not an emotion. It's an action. Christian, it's an action. It's something you do. It's not something you feel. Hollywood makes you think it's something you do. You feel. It's not an emotion. It's not an involuntary thing. I'm with my wife after... Uh, how many years is it since 1980? What's it been? All right, yeah. Okay, it's going to be 38 years in August. All right. Sorry, honey. I mean, all right, so... Love, we have chosen to love each other. It's not about, you guys, John, you and Carol, you guys know, it's not about being in love. You know, maybe it was at first, but th- how long have you guys been married? Well, I'm 45 years. 45. Awesome. Now, you, if you're honest, you will say, there are times when you really have loved John. There's times you wanted to wring his little neck too, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. She's like, yeah. Is that today one of those times? No, you don't want to answer. Oh, she's going, yeah, kind of, yeah. Her hands are moving slowly towards his throat. Uh, yeah, it's not about being in love. It's about choosing to love. I've chosen Cindy, and she's chosen me. We've chosen to love each other. Love is an action, okay? So when you put on love, see, people think, you know, People think, like being filled with the Spirit, it's all about the gifts. Oh, I can show off how spiritual I am now. I can speak in tongues. I can interpret. I can prophesy. I can... No, it's not a... Listen, if the Holy Spirit is about anything, He's about love, first and foremost. And if you read honestly about the gifts of the Spirit, they're always to be done in love. In 1 Corinthians 12. Always. It's all about the love, folks. Either have it or you don't. But if you don't have it, you just get that thing out of the closet and put it on. And putting on is as simple as this. God, today I want to put on your love. I want to see people as you see them. And then when you come to church, you won't shy away from anybody. You won't come late and leave early. You're like, Pastor Lee, Goldie, how you doing? (laughs) Kissing them on the cheek and just loving on each other. Pastor Lee kisses me on the cheek all the time. No, we're not that kind of church. Listen, <laughs> it's a brotherly slash fatherly thing, right? Because I kiss all my, I have five boys, no girls, five grown sons. I, I, we kiss, every, kiss each other on the cheek every time we see each other. Amen? Because we want to show love. We don't just want to you know, think it. We want to show it. It's important we show love. Matthew, I hug you every time I see you, right? Do you like that? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't like it as much at first. You're getting better at hugging. You know, oh yeah, we should have a hugging class, you know, because like some people come at you sideways and they barely touch you with their fingertips like this. What is that? Yeah, I'm really feeling the love. What is that? Come over here, you know, so get better. You gotta, some of you got to get better at the hugging thing, but, uh, you know. And for those of you that are new, Paul, the Apostle Paul, and six epistles saying greet one another with a holy kiss. So it's just physical affirmation. It's just showing someone that you care about them. And a hug ministers to you. If I'm depressed and I'm down here, and I get a hug from somebody at church, I come up to here. I mean, I don't go skyrocketing, okay, but it lifts me a little bit. If I get ten hugs, you know what I'm saying? It's like a thermometer. And after a while, I'm like, oh, life isn't so bad after all. That's why you go to church. It's one of the reasons. You're like, life is good. God is, that's why people feel so great when they get out of church. It amazes me that people do that for a while, and then stupidly, and I do use the word stupid, forgive me, they stop going. And then the next time I see them, their life's turned to you know what? What? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then they come, they come dragging back into church. <laughs> and, I, and see, if I don't put on love, that's one of those times when I go, don't you ever learn? 
What's the matter with you? You see, but then I put on love. It's like, oh, it's good to see you, dear sister. Well, we've missed you, dear brother. You know, then I go home and then it starts to fade. I'm like, that idiot. No. <laughs> I'm just being honest. We're keeping it real here today, all right? Uh, so just in closing, comfort the person next to you. In closing, do what to, how do you act out love? Do what you would do to this person if you actually really, really did love them a lot. That's simple. What would I do if I really, you know, I don't really know this person, but what would I do if I loved them? Just do that. Love is an action, as we said. It's not a feeling. So take actions of love. We have to unlearn what the world has taught us about love. And we've got to relearn what the Word of God tells us that love is. And just, it's, a, it's a, not a matter of striving, it's just a matter of allowing. Allowing God to love people through you. And we must learn how to let God's love dominate us. It's got to be the dominating force in your life. Not your emotions, not your thought life, not your anger or bitterness, not logic. It's got to be God's love. And if his love dominates you, you're not going to fail. Do you know why? Because the Bible says love never fails. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Bow your heads for a moment. And uh, Walter, you want to come? Thank you, Father. Thank you for your sweet presence. I just, um, Christian, you know the Lord, don't you? Or, or have you met, when did you meet Jesus? You were real young? Yeah. Good. You love him with all your heart. Everything. Yeah. Amen. I'm so glad. And I want to ask you guys, uh, Terry, sweetheart. Yeah. Do you know Jesus? Is he your savior? Good, sweetheart. When did you uh, When did you ask the Lord to come into your heart? Seventy six. And. So you had a rededication in 1985. Sometimes you, your love wanes. We get distracted. Understood. How about you, Rob? Do you know Jesus Christ? Is, is he part of your life? Would you like to come back to him today? Still moving towards it? I encourage you not to procrastinate it. Because, you know, he takes us, I mean... You seem like a logical guy. He takes us right where we are. You know, when I received Christ, Rob, it was actually 74, believe it or not, it's a long time ago. I told the person who was speaking to me, obviously, I said, I need, I didn't say exactly the way you did. I said, I need to get some things together before I do that. And he said, Jesus wants to come in there and help you get the things together. He, he knows right where you are. It's, we're not fooling anybody. He knows where all of our hearts are. But he, he wants to jump right into your life, right where it is, and help you move towards him. He's moving towards you. The scripture says, draw near to God, and he draws near to you. It's like a kiss. When I want to kiss my wife, I go part of the way and she comes the other part of the way and then all of a sudden there we are. How about you, Heather? Are you ready? Do you want to invite Christ into your life today, sweetheart? Not right now? Many, many people say that. And darling, in the middle, what's your name again? Krista. What do you think, Krista? Jesus, the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the door to your heart, and Jesus is knocking today. He says, If anyone lets me in, I'll come in and I'll fellowship with them. I'll be part of them. You want to, you want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart today, darling?
He's in there, but what? Are you married to Rob? Are you? Okay. Wow. Well, we're here to help. Anything you guys need. And that goes for you too, Heather. Okay. So, last, Rob, what do you think, buddy? You still want to wait on this, or would you like to make the move? Okay, I encourage you. I mean, if you're married to this sweet lady, I want to encourage you to take the lead spiritually. You know, she will follow you. If you give your heart to Christ fully, guess what? Your wife will too. That's how it works in marriage. So I want to encourage you that way. You let me know if you want to talk after service. I'll be available. All right. somebody in here suffered at some point a neck or a spinal injury or something and uh, I mean it healed but there's, you still get pain or discomfort or something is that you Carol? okay and uh, where do you get the pain? where's the pain? okay that's what I was feeling like sometimes I feel what God wants to heal. I feel it. In the name of Jesus right now, sweetheart. Um, is that John coming in right now? Who's coming? Yeah. Hey, John, would you put, put your hand on the back of your wife's neck, would you, brother? And show him, is the, show him where it's at, Carol. Have him put his hand right. Is that where we got it? Okay. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ right now, I pray that your healing power, your healing virtue now would flow through John's hand into her neck and into her spine. I just, I, and I speak to that, that bone spur and I command it to be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. All pain, all discomfort has to go. For the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Carol, I, I call you healed by faith in the Son of God. By His power and His virtue. Receive it. Uh, someone, uh, like, you're, I'm feeling like it's like a tinge in the back, like behind my knee. Uh, in that joint area, maybe. Is there somebody that's having, I don't know, it kind of runs up the back of your thigh. Who is that? Is that you? Okay. All right, Ida. And uh, which one is it? Which leg is it? The right. The right one. Okay. Uh, just put your hand uh, where it hurts, Ida. And Jeff, put your hand on her, on her shoulder, if you don't mind. This is what God does. This is just the Father's love. I mean, I don't know, have any way of knowing this stuff. You, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus right now, I, I call Ida healed. I call her the back of her leg, her thigh, that joint, whatever's causing that pain right now. I command it to be healed in the name of Jesus. And I command the inflammation in that leg to, uh, to go away. So go away, be healed completely, without pain, without discomfort, that she can walk and sit and move her leg freely without any, feeling any of that hurt, any of that injury. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say be healed. And just, you know, the best thing to say is, Lord, I receive it. Just tell the Lord, I receive that. Wow. God is so good. Uh, Dave, you know, the, you've told me about the after effects. Cause, is it alright if I tell them what happened? 
Okay. They've had a stroke. How many years ago was that? 22 months ago. Occasionally you get a little dizzy. You still... Where, where would be the area you would focus prayer, that I would focus prayer for healing? Would it be in your, your brain or where? Briefly, <laughs> briefly as possible. Sweetie, Joy, put your hand on your husband's shoulder or wherever you, you feel led to. Everybody, would you stretch your hands towards this brother? We just met him. He's such a good guy. He's been playing drums. and He's a good-hearted man. This is the sweetest couple. Joy and Dave, they're the sweetest couple in the, you want to meet. Father, I speak to Dave right now. I speak to his mind, to his spine, to the entire left side of his body. And I say, in Jesus' name, be healed and rejuvenated. I ask that by your power and your virtue that there would be complete, total recovery. You said we would lay hands on those that are sick and that they would recover. I pray for complete recovery in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the, the partial, but we want the whole. No more dizzy spells, no more pain, no more disorientation. None of those things that would affect him. Lord, I pray that he become as good as new, better than he was before the stroke. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. You agree with that? There's power in that agreement. Pammy and Bernie, lay hands on Trish right now. Because Trish has been having some physical issues. And Trish, darling, just say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I receive your complete healing I thank you now that my entire body inside and out comes into line with the word of God Jesus I receive your healing virtue I receive your healing power every part of my physiology every part of my innards in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Everybody just turn to her and say, Be healed. You're, yeah, in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in that declaration. There's power. There's power in this place right now. Can you feel it? Do you feel the power of God in this place right now? It's, it's incredible right now. All right, so for everyone that has an ailment, if you can reach it or touch it, put your hand on it. If not, just put your hand on your chest. I want to pray for you in Mass while this anointing is here because these things are they have a temporary lifespan you know all right so put ready all right say jesus, jesus i receive I, I call myself healed not by my own power but by your power thank you lord i receive it now father in the name of jesus i call everybody everybody in this room Everyone in this room, healed. I speak to sickness and disease and command it to leave in the name of Jesus. Uh, there's somebody, and there's somebody watching right now in live streaming. And you're having pain. And I want to say it's in the right side of your, your head in this area. And it's been worrying you. I call you healed. Put your hand right on your head in the name of Jesus. I call you healed. And just say that little prayer. Say, Jesus, I receive my healing right now uh, there's someone also watching right now that you have a, I'm feeling like a, a, like some pain right in your shoulder put your hand right on that shoulder I, I think you had maybe a shoulder separation and it's still you haven't really recovered fully or it still bothers you it's not an extreme pain but it's like a dull it's not like a sharp but you're feeling you have this dull constant pain and when you move your arm, it gets a little worse. So put your hand on your shoulder right now. And if there's anybody in here that has that too, do that. You know, the more God can touch more than one person. But you're watching right now. I call you healed and just, you have to receive it yourself. Say, Jesus, I receive a healing for my shoulder. And I thank you for your power and your love. 
in Jesus' name. I want to thank you for watching also, those of you that are out there. All right, I don't, I don't have anything else. I think we're, unless someone else has. David, go ahead. What do you got? Yeah. This is Dave Graves, for those of you that are new here. He's actually my brother-in-law. You have it on, Kenny, right? Okay. The passage you started out with today has been one of my favorites. Yeah. It's a good one. There's absolutely nothing in that encounter with Jesus and Peter where Jesus is condemning him at all. This passage, to me, has always been one of the most restorative passages in yeah. the Bible. Yeah. Do you know what what happened just prior to this? Peter denied him three times. Yeah. This encounter that in John shortly after the resurrection, and I, I believe it was one of the first person-to-person -person encounters with Jesus and Peter. Peter denied him three times. Love always restores. Amen. There's nothing in love that'll beat you down and condemn you. Right. That's right. So when Jesus approached him and said, Peter, do you agape me? Yes, he was convicting him and reminding him of his failure. And God has oftentimes done that in my life with the purpose of meeting me where I am and saying, yeah, I understand. Love always restores. Yes. Forgiveness is always moving towards restoration. Amen. Moving towards healing. Yes. So when you look at that, and Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Peter comes back, Lord, you know I phileo you. You're my friend. I can only step up and say that. I can't go right. and say, Lord, I agape you. You know, Peter was, was brazenly bold in saying, Lord, you know, just a few days before, Lord, I'd die for you. He got a taste of his own pride in that when he yeah. couldn't even confront and answer a young girl that he was with Jesus. So Jesus comes back to him a second time and says, Lord, or, or, he says to Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Peter still says, Lord, you know I'm your friend. You know, there's a reality there of what Peter was feeling and, and sensing inside. And then the third time the Lord says to him, okay, Peter, I know who you are. You know who I am. Are you my friend? And Peter says, yes. Yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. You know I have that much in me right now to say yes in, in agreement with that. And Jesus didn't send him away. He still gave him his commission to feed the sheep, the lambs, yeah. the mature. Yeah, amen. Love always restores. Yes, it does. And that's why I say this passage in John is one of the most restorative passages in the scriptures. Jesus encountering somebody who had just failed miserably. Like many times in my life, I've failed miserably and the Lord is there. Okay, let's clean up the mess. Pick you back up. Put you where you belong. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're not there all the way. You don't agape me. But yeah, I can see that there's that fondness, that friendship there. Right. He always works towards healing. Yes. He always works towards restoration. Yes. Amen. So I, you know, I don't know a lot about anybody's lives in here, but you know, if you've been in a mess, in a mess, feeling beat down, condemning yourself, right? That's usually, you know, a lot of the condemnation isn't coming from others; it's coming from yourself. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Amen. That comes from the enemy, and it will come from yourself. 
just remember love restores love does not condemn it restores yes thank you david god bless you good word good word it's been a good day in the house of god amen matthew thank you for reading walter thank you for playing worship team good job all right how many want to party anybody hungry all right how's what's the food situation back there what's that jeff what do we do brother tell us all right let's welcome jeff up